I said a good guess would be around 762 B.C. Now in chapter 1, verse 3, through chapter 2, verse 5, he pronounces judgment on these nations surrounding Israel. So the target where he's going to be focusing is the northern kingdom of Israel. And I put the map up the first couple of weeks. But he starts off with oracles of judgment against all of the nations around Israel. And you can just see this, that he, he doesn't spend much time doing that compared to what he's going to say to Israel. But you can just see the people in the northern kingdom as he's prophesying this way, just saying, yeah, that's right. You know, the Edomites really need, they need to get it. The Phoenicians need it. The Philistines need it. You know, that's right. That's right. That's right. And then he turns his attention to the northern kingdom of, of Israel. Uh, he does that. If the first oracle in, in chapter 2, verse 6 through chapter 6, verse 14, all of that he delivers oracles of judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the first oracle of doom is given in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. And he tells them in chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, that they're guilty of having abused and exploited the poor and the underprivileged. You remember that Israel at this time, I mean, the good times were rolling. Israel was wealthy. Uh, they had, uh, in fact, they have recovered... Uh, some ivory from, it was from a time earlier than that, from Samaria. But, but there was a lot of wealth. And they were, uh, you know, the wealthy were oppressing the poor. And as I said, that shouldn't shock people. That that seems to be a very human condition. That is, if I have the money and the power to exploit you, that I do it. And so this is what's, what's going on here. And in chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, he rebukes them. For having rejected the God who blessed them by delivering them out of Israel, bringing them up out of Israel, giving them, giving them the land of the seemingly invincible Amorites, and blessing them by giving them people for their spiritual welfare in the form of Nazarites and prophets. This God who had blessed them, he rebukes them for rejecting a God who had blessed them so richly. And in chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, he tells them that they will be punished by being defeated militarily. He's telling the northern kingdom, can you imagine this shepherd up when the good times are rolling in the northern kingdom saying to the people of Israel, you are going down. And he tells them that, and of course this is fulfilled. This is around 762. This is fulfilled when the Assyrians complete their conquest of the northern kingdom in 722, 721 when Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, falls to the Assyrians, led by Sargon. So here you see this, you wind up, and you have this, this being fulfilled. Now the second oracle of doom is in chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 3. And it opens in chapter 3, verse, in verses 1 and 2, with the point that Israel's special relationship with God didn't operate to excuse their sin. Rather, it made their sin more culpable. And that's this where you, you, you see in chapter in verse 2 it says, You only have I known of all the families of earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. You know, we'd be sitting there going, You only have I known. You have an intimate relationship with me. You are my covenant partners, therefore I will excuse your sin. He doesn't say that. You see, he doesn't say that. He says, Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. See, to be God's elect is a position of responsibility. They should have been the last people on earth to reject God's, uh, to reject God, to reject the Holy One. They were in relationship with Him. He had blessed them richly. They were His people. We had a bond. Of all the people to turn and disregard me, you're the last people to do it. And so it's a position of responsibility. When, when we ended last week... I was pounding this application, you see, that the, that the church's intimate relationship with God must never be used to excuse or justify sins. You see, by God's grace, we have a special relationship with Him. There's no question. We have a special relationship with Him. We have been chosen by Him in Christ to be His children. We are in that close, intimate relationship with Him. And our response is to be one of obedience 
and holy living, not indifference and rebellion. It is because of the relationship we are to be people who lay our lives down for him because we love him. You see, and we looked at some text on that, Matthew 5, let your light shine, 1 Peter, uh, be holy because he is holy. That's the response that we are to have. Now yet, to, to pick back up there, the voices that seek to pervert our intimacy with God into a license to sin have always been present. There's nothing new about that. They've always been present. Jude verse 4, for certain men slipped in stealthily the ones having been marked out long ago for this condemnation, godless men who have perverted the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there are people who are saying, no, 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 you see, he's not worried about that. Come on, you, you can do no wrong. Your relationship with him means that you don't have to be concerned about moral living. We have transcended that. Don't get hung up on this idea, well, does he want you to do anything? Does he want you? No, don't worry about that. You see, he just loves you. You see, there have always been these voices. You can see it here in 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 and 2. He says, but there were also false prophets among the people, as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves, and many will follow their licentious acts. So what are these people doing? In addition to having some eschatological errors that they're selling, these people are also involved in licentious acts and the idea is that, look, God is too big to care about that. He's not concerned with those kind of mundane things about what you do with your physical... Act. That's child's play. That's old news. That's old religion. So these voices have always been there that are seeking to uh, turn our intimacy with God into a license. This, is, this happens, I'm afraid, in too many places today in the name of Christianity. This is the doctrine that at least uh, not too long ago we would refer to as cheap grace. Now, sometimes that offends people. Grace is free. Grace is free. There is a responsibility that comes with this. I remember there was a poll quite a few years ago now in which a uh, Gallup poll. There were 66% of adults claimed that they had made a commitment to Jesus Christ. American adults, 66% said they had made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, that's encouraging. I said, well, that'd be good. You know, I didn't believe it, but I said, that'd be good. And then uh, just a few years later, James Patterson, he published a book called The Day America Told the Truth. And Patterson based, he had lengthy interviews. He did a poll instead of just going, he interviewed people at length. And from his poll, he discovered that nine out of 10 adults lie regularly. I said, wait a minute, 66% said they made a commitment to Jesus. Uh, nine out of ten of them lie regularly. According to Ronald Sider, in his book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience, polls show that Protestants who claim to take the Bible and their faith seriously, in other words, what we would call evangelicals, people who are into it. You see, polls of those people show that they divorce their spouses just as often as their secular neighbors, beat their wives as often as their neighbors, and are almost as materialistic and even more racist than their pagan friends. And Sider says, scandalous behavior is rapidly destroying American Christianity. By their daily activity, most, quote, Christians regularly commit treason, and I love that phrase, treason, betrayal of the one who gave them and the one they serve in this bond, you see. They regularly commit treason. With their mouths, they claim that Jesus is Lord, but with their actions, they demonstrate allegiance to money, sex, and self-fulfillment. And you can see this <clears throat> uh, too often. See, so many claim to have fellowship with, with God and yet walk in the darkness. You know what John says, right? Apostle John, 1 John 1, 5 to 7, he says, And this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light 
and in him there is no darkness at all. He's atomic white. You see, no darkness at all. Absolutely, perfectly morally pure. If we say that we have fellowship with him, we're in covenant, we are in a relationship with him, he's our father, and walk in the darkness. We lie and do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. You see, there is this sense of living the truth of our faith, living consistently with it. See, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about one's righteousness being earned by how one lives or performs. You see, whenever, whenever you talk about the moral responsibility to the love of God, you always have to check yourself because someone will say, you're harping on works, you're a legalist. And I just sit there and I say, you don't understand what legalism is about. You see, this has nothing to do with the concept of I'm going to gain my standing with God by my performance, by my works. I can never do that. Everybody who can read the Bible understands I can never do that. The question is, does my faith carry with it? Some obedience and some response. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about what Amos and Jesus and John and the other inspired writers are talking about. The fact that biblical faith is the yes of the total person, not simply the assent of his mind. It is a yes of the total person, including a surrender of the will. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, I've read this quote a number of times to you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor. He was executed by the Nazis shortly before the Allies came in and liberated Germany. Bonhoeffer says this in one of his writings, The Cost of Discipleship. He says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the kingly rule of Christ. For whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Do you see there is more involved in this? In saying, I am a Christian, there is no more radical shift than when somebody says, I'm going to, from living in the world and being my own person and being God, to I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. That is, a tr that is not some, oh, what do you think? Well, hey, I don't know. I think I'll, yeah, why don't I do that? It is something that is radical and life transforming. And we have to understand that. We have to recognize that. We have to see that. And we have to tell people that. If we tell people, listen, no, 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 being a Christian, don't worry about it. You're not going to have to change anything. No, no, no. It's just a title shift. You just keep being the way you are. There is no surrender. There is none of this. It's just a title shift. Now you just call yourself a Christian, but you are the same person and live the same way. Nonsense. Nonsense. There is a surrender and you cannot surrender without having that surrender reflected in your life. It's simply impossible. Okay, so this Amos talks about, Amos will have much to say about this. So much so you may be throwing things at me before I'm through. But I'm going to, I'm going to say what Amos says. This is how I look at my role in life. When I have an opportunity to speak it, I'm going to do the best I can to let Amos speak. And so I just, I give it a shot. All right. He goes in chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. Now this reads better if I had kept the little, the paragraph breaks, but I wanted to fit it all in a slide. But he says here, do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he's taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there's no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it's taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? 
Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And what I think Amos is doing here is he's giving a defense of his prophetic ministry. And the point ultimately, I think, is that the prophet is just a messenger. The prophet is simply a messenger. You see here in the, in the first uh, verses uh, 3 through 6, the, the, you have the climactic truism. He gives these truisms. They're rhetorical questions. The understood answer to all of them is no. It's be like our question, does a chicken have lips? I mean, you know, you sit there and say, no, no. He says, do you walk together unless they, they've agreed to me? No. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no? No. Does a young lion go, no. Does a bird fall? No. Does a snare spring up? No. Is a trumpet blown in a city, which was the warning that your city's coming under attack? Is a trumpet blown in the city and the people aren't afraid? Well, of course not. And he says, does disaster come to a city? unless the Lord has done it. So here he's writing to these Israelites, letting them know that God is the one who will bring troops to your city. He is the one who will bring judgment on your city. And then he says here, so you have this climactic truism is that the Lord causes the destruction. And then in verse 7, the Lord doesn't do these things without revealing his intention to his prophets. When he's going to do this, when he's going to condemn a city in Judah and Israel, he tells the prophets of his intent, and what do the prophets do? You see, they go and they speak that intent. The Lord, he says here, has announced the destruction of Samaria. Now here they are, they're wealthy, they're powerful, it's wonderful. Here's a shepherd, a shepherd from a, no, from a dinky town. So he's got no status that way. And he's up there by the power of the Spirit of God saying to them. He's telling them that the Lord has announced the destruction of Samaria. Amos is simply the messenger. This isn't my decision, my choice. I'm not the one. I am simply the messenger. He says, the Lord has roared. He has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken who can but prophesy? The bridge is out. You're on the way. I must speak to you what God has revealed to me. I have to say it. You see, I'm just the messenger. I'm speaking it. I'm speaking it. And then he said, see, when I think about this, I say, well, what can this mean to us? And I think about, see, Scripture is from God, right? Scripture is the word of God. You can see in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, other places. See, men move by the Spirit. You see, they, they wrote down exactly what God, they were simply the instruments of the word of God, the message of God. That's what Scripture is. So we're not responsible for its content. Our function, our role is to deliver God's message faithfully, to deliver it accurately, to speak the truth of God. I've said to people, you know, anybody teaching, you see, you hate to be misrepresented. If somebody comes up to me and says, hey, you know, Ashby says he's all for such and such, and that's not true, well, I'm chapped. <laughs> I don't like somebody to be saying this is what he thinks and believes and feels when it's not true because he's misrepresenting me. Well, we who speak, you see, we have to be careful. Now, are we sinful, fallible? Yes, yes, yes. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Do I fully expect that on that day the Lord will go to me? You know, you thought you knew this, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Well, you were wrong. Okay, dude, I'm certain that's going to happen. But we have a responsibility, see, to work, to really try not to misrepresent God, and that's what we do. And we must not distort the message, you see, to make it more pleasing to our hearers. And that is a tremendous temptation. It is a tremendous temptation to change the message so I will make it something you will like more. You say, well, no. Either you'll say, oh, that was really great. Or like, look, 
I'm trying to say what this says. If it bums you out, my question is, did I say what it said? You see, that's it. Did I say what it said? Now, if I'm wrong about, you know, if I didn't say what it said, well, then I'm bummed. <laughs> you see, but this idea, this, the, the, if we start to do this thing, say, well, let me think about this. Uh, you know, I think that uh, people would like this and, you know, just stay off of that and do No good. <laughs> you see, we have to just present the word of God and we let the chips fall where they may. You know, I think about people in, in the world here who, with the truth of discipleship, what I was talking about before, the idea that, no, 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 look, look. Just kind of uh, come into Christianity without any difference at all. No, no, no. You just come in, hang out with us a little bit, and, you know, and, and then maybe, you, yeah, come on. Why don't you just join us? Why? Because we're nice people, and you'd like to hang out with us, and we have potlucks, and we have this kind of thing. Like potlucks, okay? Not condemning potlucks. <laughs> I'm just saying, you see, the idea, do that for these kinds of reasons. Why not? You see, and what somebody has to come to see is the Christ who died for them. They have to come to see that. That I am lost, and he is my redemption, and he has paid the price, and I will give him everything in my life. I surrender to him, and if he puts his finger on something in my life and says, that's got to go, it's gone. Well, somebody said, wait a minute. I didn't know about all that. Are you telling me that to give my life to Christ, that means that I'm going to have to quit doing this and this and this and start doing this and this? And this? Yes. Well, I don't know if I want that. Well, see, it's that point with many times, oh, no, no. <gasps> you, don't, you don't want to, no, no, no. You don't want to, you remember when Jesus is talking, he gives them hard teaching. He said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? And he says, here you have some of his disciples leaving it. And he turns to them and he just sits there and says to them, hey, you going to go too? He doesn't sit there and go, wait, <laughs> wait. I didn't mean for it to be so hard when I'm talking about you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I didn't mean it. Because I didn't know that would actually offend you and cause you to leave me. He just said, you going to go too? <laughs> you see, you going to go too. So I look at, you know, I, I see groups and things that want to diminish the call of discipleship because if we make it easier for people, less threatening to them, that people will more readily come in, people have to come to Jesus. You see what I'm saying? They have to come to Jesus, and they have to see him, and they have to surrender to him. And that's part of this whole process of conversion. I think about it in 2 Timothy. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, when it's palatable and when it's not palatable, when they like it and when they don't like it. It is never the messenger's task to sit here and say, well, you know, is it something that well, if I say that, the question is, what is the message of God? And you present it. You present that message. And then you trust that God will use through his spirit the message that is presented. And what you have here going on, he's telling you, listen, uh, they're silencing prophets up there. And we'll see that. We already saw that in one place, and we'll see it again. So you have this, you have this here. He tells them. He sits here and he says, in season out is for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths as you always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. So he's speaking to he, Timothy, he says, listen, here's, here's the deal. Uh, you got to preach that word in season and out of season. That's your calling. That is what you are to do. Now, he says in, in verses 9 and 10 of Amos chapter 3, he says, proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod. Now, there's a textual question. This may originally say Assyria. Okay, so Ashdod or Assyria. But he says, proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt. Okay, Ashdod or Assyria and Egypt, pagan places. He says, proclaim in these strongholds Say there, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. Well, Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom, the capital of Israel. He wants the pagans to gather 
at Samaria. Tell them, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumult within her and the oppressed in her midst. What's he after him about? You have depressed, you have, you have oppressed the poor, the underprivileged. You have abused and you have exploited them. He's calling pagans to come and see in Samaria what's going on. He calls them as witnesses. He says, they do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. He calls the world, see, even the world that doesn't possess or accept the guidance of Scripture knows better than to act like Samaria. He can call pagans to look at what Samaria is doing. Look how they're treating people. And the pagans would blush at this. The pagans would wind up blushing even though they don't have the guidance of Scripture. See, the, the, the Israelites... They had lost their sense of what's honest and decent and just and proper. Just generally, just the normal understanding of right and wrong that's inherent in human beings being in the image of God. They had lost even that. That you could call as witnesses against them, pagan nations. And I think, you know, it's, it's simply an outrage for the people of God with their high calling to sink to a lifestyle beneath the world. You say, well, I, I, that'll never happen. Well, you remember 1 Corinthians 5? You had a guy who's with his, with his uh, father's wife. It's just something even the pagans throw up about. Those are my words, not his, but that's the same sentiment. <laughs> even the pagans would look at that and say that's ridiculous. You know, and our world's gotten to the point now, what could you point to? <laughs> you see, what could you point to? You can still point to some things. You can point to people who take child abusers and hide them and shuttle them off somewhere else so they can harm other children for the sake of the institution. You see? You, you can find things. But the point is, is that given our high calling, you see, it's just something terrible to sink to a lifestyle beneath the world. We must never do. We're to live above the world in terms of morality and ethics. We are to be examples we are to be exemplary you know and the danger when you try to live your life that way the world is hostile the world will attack you and the world will say oh you think you're so good you're trying to be self-righteous no I'm trying to be faithful to Christ that's what I'm trying to be and that's just the an attempt to bully you off of that oh no well, I'm sorry that I'm trying to do right and I don't want to go get drunk with you or fall into fornication or whatever it is going on that you think's cool and you're trying to get me to do. No, 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 okay. No, I'm trying to be right. And if that makes you feel bad, what can I say? What can I say? I'm going to be faithful. I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be faithful. He states their punishment in chapter 3, verse 11. He says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you and your strongholds shall be plundered. Now, you got to see these people looking at the shepherd. <laughs> and he's in there just telling them, you're going down. You're absolutely going down. He states their punishment, and then he elaborates on their punishment. He says in, in 3, 12 to 15, really I'd read 12 separately, but so that's why I just broke the paragraph there. He says, thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs and a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and a part of a bed. That's how it's going to be. Scraps. Remnants. This judgment that is coming is going to be serious business. You see? You're going to be decimated. He says, hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house. And the houses of ivory shall perish. And the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. You see, these people who are really living high. 
Now, is he condemning wealth per se? No. What he's condemning is the fact that the wealthy, how do they treat and exploit and trample the poor and cheat them and do bribes to build up their own estate? You see, they're in absolutely in love with money. You see, the things here, on, you see, first in, in 12, there's only going to be a remnant left, just scraps. And then in 13 to 15, the things on which they base their security, you see, the things in which they place their hope. That's what this stuff is about. He sits here and he says, I will punish the altars of Bethel. You see, I'll punish the altars of Bethel. The horns on the altar be cut off and I'll strike all these luxurious homes. Well, what's that about? You see, it's the, the things in which they base their security, the things in which they place their hope. What is that? It is their heartless, religious ritual he's going to have much more to say about that this idea that i can live apart from my covenant responsibilities that i can live any way i want abusing the poor exploiting the poor trampling them cheating them doing all that stuff and that if somehow i come to an altar and offer something that god is going okay i'm cool where, where would such an idea come from? You see, it comes from a mechanistic, ritualistic idea that God, I can get over on God, I'll live however, and if I just do the right rituals, I'll be cool. And that's just a joke. You see, it's just a joke. It's always been a joke. And so he says here, he's, the things in which they trust, you see, this idea that trusting in this heartless religious ritual and in their wealth you see rich people this is one of the, the big temptations is you always have your your peace and your security and your trust it's so easy to put it in your money because i will always be okay because i have money if something happens i can buy and do and get you see it's easy to trust in my wealth that that will that will immunize me from the difficulties of life I don't care what God brings here, you see. So I'm going to trust in this empty religious ritual and in my wealth, but these things will not save them. He's saying these things will prove to be a vicious deception. That's what they're going to prove to be. Here you are relying on them, trusting in them, and on that day you're going to turn out it's going to be just a deception. You put your trust in something that was, that was empty. Now I have more to say on this. We get to chapter 5. Uh, he has a lot to say about this, so I'm going, I'm going to save some of what I want to say, <laughs> okay, because uh, I think it's an important point. Now, here he goes in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into Harmon, declares the Lord. You see, here he says, he, he refers to the wives, the women here. See, their insatiable desire for luxury their insistence on luxurious living, it drove their husbands to exploitation and depression. It drove them to squeeze out everything they could because they're living in the lap of luxury and they're saying, bring us drinks. This is what we want. And so it motivated and drove them to this exploitation and this oppression. See, those who thus inspire and motivate others to sin will not escape God's judgment. So he's saying the fact you are simply the motivator. You are the one sitting in the background going, no, come on, go, go, get, get, get. And the husband's over here responding and responding. He's culpable. He doesn't get to turn around and say, my wife made me do it. Okay. He doesn't get to do that. But she's not off the hook because she has an agent who's doing her bidding. You see? She's not off the hook. She will be judged for that. Now see, I think about those who use their relationship with Christians to pull people from their commitment to Christ. See, to encourage them 
uh, to disobey God. You have spouses who do that. You have friends who do that. You have co-workers who do that, who use their relationship with people, what? To pull them, to get them to do things they shouldn't be doing, to motivate them that way. And the fact is, is that those people will not escape judgment, you see. I mean, it's a serious thing to be a stumbling block to the people of God. I think somebody said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure somebody said that. Matthew 18. So, I mean, you see this idea. I think, you, so he's, he's after him. He tells him, listen, you can't hide. You can't escape. And then he's going to explain. He's going to give some explanations of their doom. He's going to tell them some more about it. And he tells them first, and he's going to do that in, in, in chapter 4, verse 4 through 13. I'm going to break this up. And in verses four, chapter 4, verses 4 to 5, he says, Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal, and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them. For so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. You see, there was an absolute total disconnect between their religion and their lives. There was just a disconnect. And I fear that disconnect. Because I fear that talking about and insisting that there be no disconnect has gotten a bad name in religious circles. <laughs> You see, it's like, well, I don't want to go there. You're going to make me feel bad. Well, only if you need to, right? And if you need to, then you need to. And you ought to be going, thank you. Not just me. I'm talking about anybody who says that, right? You ought to be seeing if I need something spiritually and somebody provides it. The test is, did it make me feel good? The test is, did it bless me? You see, that's the test. And so here you have this complete disconnect. Bethel and Gilgal, these are, these are two great Israelite sanctuaries or worship centers. And see, it's so easy to be deceived into thinking that one has a relationship with God while one is living in rebellion. These people are in flat-out rebellion. Look at the description of them, how they're treating people who are close to God's heart, how they're abusing and exploiting and cheating and doing all this stuff. And they think... That they have a relationship with God. They think that they have a relationship with God. And see, we have a great capacity for fooling ourselves into thinking that God is not concerned with daily living. No, see, what we, he, he's concerned with faith. You see, that's how we do it. Okay, that's true. But we have to see, what do, what do we mean by faith? He's concerned with faith, of course. That's, the, that's central. But what is faith? Do you think faith is simply believing certain sets of facts? Is biblical faith not believing those facts, but submitting to those facts? In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? He said, do you, do you think I'm interested in the fact your mouth can form these words? I want to know, are they true? That's what I want to know. Is there truth behind it? And so that's the idea, you see. We have this capacity for fooling ourselves that God's not concerned with daily living because we say all that matters is faith, but that's true. But what we've done, we have bled faith of its content. We have reduced it to simply intellectual assent, and it's never that. It is the yes of the total person where I said, I believe and I'm giving in accordance with that. I'm giving my life. I'm going to order my life that way. Well, that's a different case now, right? Now you have a much different thing about saying, well, how I can just divorce life. Life doesn't have anything to do with my being a Christian. God doesn't care about how I live. How can you say that? How can you say he doesn't care that? I remember some 20 years ago now. You were Magic Johnson contracted HIV from having sex with hundreds of women. And I remember watching him on Arsenio Hall. And he went on there and he said, uh, yeah, that God is the most important thing in his life. Now, you know, I could have accepted. Somebody says, listen, I have sinned and I'm repenting. I just stood up and cheered. 
Now, I don't care if he slept with a hundred women, a thousand women. If he's penitent, God bless. <laughs> you see? But I didn't hear any of that. What I heard was like these two, there's no inconsistency between my running around like a dog and Christ being the top thing in my life. And that's our culture. That's our society. And we can't let that come in because it's nonsense. You can't disconnect the two and say, God doesn't care about how I live. I told you before that poll about the 66% of the American adults, and then you have all of them lying. See, the truth is that there cannot be a divorce between religion and life. We already read 1 John 5, 1 to 7. You can see 1 John 2, 3, and 6. He says, and by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. By this, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And in this one, the truth is not. But whoever keeps his word, truly, is the, is, truly in this one, the love of God has reached perfection. By this, we may know we are in him. The one who claims to abide in him ought himself to walk just as that one walked. Now, i got to say one thing. I heard that bell. This will just take a second. But I don't want to leave you. You understand the idea of walking. It doesn't mean sinless perfection, right? I use the example of the baby who falls coming to the father. Fall up, fall up, fall up. Just keep coming, just keep coming, just keep coming. You see, we walk, we, you and I stumble in sin a lot. But there is a difference between that and my saying, I don't care. Do you see? You understand it in your kid. You understand the difference in your kid who's striving and failing, striving and failing, striving, 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 fail, fail, strive, strive, you see. And the kid who says, there's a difference in heart there. You see, walking in the light is characteristic of a direction and a submission. It is not speaking of perfection. Because if it was, not one of us would be rejoicing. Okay, I heard that bell. Thanks for coming.